Cape One. After North Shore research was shut down in 2001, an extensive audit of its files and research was performed. The following is a series of documents, videos, and pictures centered on the St. Roche quarantine of 1998. Despite hundreds dying, history considers the quarantine a huge success. The supposed efforts of North Shore research eradicated the itch and saved many lives. Their role in the quarantine and developing a cure led to their premier status in the southeast Louisiana community. Unfortunately, it seems North Shore research enjoyed a reputation it didn't deserve. St. Roche Quarantine File 1 The alert was first issued on January 10th, 1998, at 8.15pm on all channels in southeast Louisiana three hours after state and local officials became aware of the Omega Helminthus. It was broadcasted at the top of every hour for all 28 days of the quarantine. It is important to note that at this point, details on the Omega Helminthus were few. Many still believed that the illness was a fungus or virus. Regional Alert Primary Entry Point System issued an emergency alert notification. This is not a test. Repeat, this is not a test. Primary Entry System issued an emergency action notification for the town of St. Roche and the surrounding communities. Effective immediately, exits 47, 48, 49, 50, and 51 off Interstate 12 will be blocked off. In addition, Highway 22 will be blocked off at the Tangipahoa Parish and City of Seidel borders due to a mandatory quarantine. Check with your local governments for alternative routes. Stay tuned to your local news outlet for more information. For more information, please continue to file 2. Holy shit! It appears that a novel disease has arisen in the St. Roche area. This disease was evidently destructive and infectious enough to warrant a quarantine. So St. Roche and the surrounding areas were subsequently quarantined and blocked off from all travel access. Oh, good thing they blocked off the Tangy Parish. We wouldn't want the brain worms to get sick. From the title card image, it also seems like it causes people to grow lots of new holes all over their skin. And I think that's pretty neat. This disease was named Omega Helminthus, which I'm assuming I'm mispronouncing, so we're gonna go with the itch. Other than a new law that I'm going to immediately ignore, let's see what other ramifications this disease had on the next tape. Tape 2, St. Roche Quarantine File 2. Dr. Christopher Wells, General Practitioner, North Shore Doctors. January 5th, 1998. Patient, Scott Griffin. Appointment, 1 p.m. Date of birth, 4-1-58. Reason for visit, possible allergic reaction. Patient is an undersea diver for the North Shore Research's Deep Sea Project. They are stationed on multiple oil rigs off the coast of Louisiana. It is a partnership program between the oil industry and the research facility, created in hopes of discovering new aquatic creatures. Patient claimed that during a routine expedition, they discovered what they thought was a new species. The unnamed specimen was harvested and brought on board to be studied. When unloading the specimen, he claimed that a white discharge from the animal touched his right forearm. Shortly after returning to shore, a cluster of hives appeared on his arm. By the time he arrived at my office, the patient was covered in hives. The patient has no known allergies. He should have gone to the hospital and was very lucky not to develop anaphylaxis. The patient received two milliliters of epinephrine and after 30 minutes, the hives receded. After an additional hour of observation, he was sent home. January 6th, 1998. Patient, Scott Griffin follow-up. At 8 a.m., my nurse followed up with Mr. Griffin. Overnight, the patient's hives had returned and developed into large cysts. Upon getting this information, I asked the patient to immediately return for a follow-up. Mr. Griffin's wife, Suzanne, called at 11, stating that the patient got extremely ill on his way to the follow-up appointment. They pulled over to the St. Roche gas station. On the way to the bathroom, his cysts popped. The patient got extremely agitated and demanded to be returned home. The nurse has made repeated calls, but there has been no answer. I will stop by his home after work. Final follow-up. What I found was horrifying. I had discovered the patient had murdered his entire family so he could soak in their blood. All the cysts on his body appeared to have opened. He was covered in hundreds of holes. When I asked what he had done, he would only reply, they won't let me kill myself. I called the police immediately. I personally had never seen an allergic reaction as intense as this one, which leads me to believe this is something more serious. Everyone he came in contact with needs to be examined and placed under quarantine. Additional information on Dr. Christopher Wells' role in the St. Roche quarantine can be found in subsequent files. This disease is being characterized as an allergic reaction to a novel substance. The source was apparently from some sort of deep sea creature. 
If he thinks he found a new species, he sure as hell got that right. Because I don't know what kind of sea cum makes you grow a bunch of tiny new little vaginas all over your skin. I know the second they said milky white discharge, y'all were like, as fuck's gonna say cum. For the last time, stop touching every white discharge that comes out of every slimy wet hole. I told you you were gonna get a disease, and look at what happened. It appears that after an initial epinephrine injection, the reaction subsided. But it didn't stay that way for long. Evidently, this wasn't any sort of regular allergic reaction. The patient's hives developed into large cysts, and one of them burst, likely infected. Susan. But don't worry, as you remember from the tape, that problem's kind of about to solve itself. After demanding to be brought home, Mr. Griffin, no relation, murder-sturbated his entire family and drained their bodies in a tub, soaking in it, before trauma-dumping all over Mr. Wells. Well, that's a mess and a half. Just get the dog to lick the shattered remains of what was once your family off the ground. I'm telling you, those little goobers are like living vacuum cleaners. Anyways, with this tape, we get some new information. That being, why the St. Roche authorities felt the need to quarantine the entire county. That being, that it's a rash that makes you fucking murder people and soak in their blood, so a quarantine is only slightly an overreaction. It appears that this disease has anomalous capacities that allow it to affect the host's behavior in extreme and violent ways. Either that, or Scott just really hated his family, and the thing to push him over the edge was just an especially itchy rash. But I don't think so. He attempted to Kermit sewer slide, apparently, so I, he probably didn't want to turn the love of his life and his beautiful children into tomato soup. If there are answers to be found here, I'd be willing to bet they're on the next tape. Which, well, I, I'm done talking about this one, we're moving on. Tape 3. St. Roche Quarantine File 3. St. Roche Hospital. Infectious Disease Ward. January 6th, 1998. Patient, Scott Griffin. Quarantine. We placed Mr. Griffin in the infectious disease ward, where we bound him to his bed. During the transport to the hospital, he ripped the skin from his forearm. I could literally see bone. I'm surprised how little he bled. Once we arrived at the hospital, I prescribed a series of powerful antihistamines and steroids. Unfortunately, it did very little to help Mr. Griffin's situation. Sheriff Lane wanted to question the patient, so we used the telephones as a makeshift intercom. I took notes of the conversation. Scott Griffin Interrogation 7.18 p.m. Why'd you kill your family there, Mr. Griffin? I didn't want to, but they made me? Who made you? The things in my skin, the rash, this damn itch. So you hurt your family because of the things on your skin? They just wouldn't stop itching unless I fed them. How did you know the blood would stop the itching? I just knew. It's like they told me without actually saying anything. The more they told me, the more my skin itched. It was a thousand times worse than anything I've ever felt. Every part of me felt like it was covered in ravenous ants, and it's not just my skin, my insides too, my brain, my heart, even the inside of my stomach felt like it was itchy. And to be honest, I don't remember hurting them. I didn't have a damn moment of clarity until I sat in that damn tub, and then I was me again, but better. The itching didn't stop. I felt better than I ever had, at least until I realized what I had done. I tried to slit my wrist, but my muscles tensed. They kept me from doing it, and I know why. My body is infested with whatever this is. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. We'll be talking again. You have a nice day now there. What do you think, Dr. Wells? Are you buying any of this? Because I'm having a hard time believing he committed murder because of some sort of allergic reaction. I can only say I've never seen anything like what's happening to his skin. And I think the best course of action would be to quarantine anyone he's been in contact with, examine them, and possibly alert the CDC. How fast can you test him and let me know if there's any truth to what he's saying? I can expedite the tests, but please, find those people. Agreed. <laughs> Unfortunately, we were too late. By the next morning, several new patients with symptoms similar to Mr. Griffin's were admitted. Three others were reported to the police for murdering and butchering their victims in the same fashion as Mr. Griffin. Update. Patient, Scott Griffin. Quarantine. This illness is obviously contagious. I made sure to take the proper precautions when gathering blood samples. For the newest patients, their open sores did not react in an unusual manner, but Mr. Griffin's sores sprayed a white mucus in my direction with alarming aim. The closer I got, the more intense the reaction. Mr. Griffin told me that he wouldn't live long if he didn't feed them. I think the patient is delusional from lack of fluid and nutrition, but it's also possible the reaction is impairing his thinking. Also. Getting the proper sample size for Mr. Griffin proved to be a challenge. His body seemed to struggle to produce enough fluids for a proper sample. I decided it was in the patient's best interest to keep him sedated and revisit this in the morning. My hope is that the reaction subsides, but I fear things may unfortunately be worse. Update. 
patient Scott Griffin, quarantine. As I feared, by morning, Mr. Griffin looked much different. Overnight, Mr. Griffin's entire body had swollen. He died at 10.14 a.m. When the hospital staff approached to resuscitate, he exploded, possibly further spreading the infection. To say that I've seen nothing like this is an understatement. Hell, I don't think anyone has. Evidently, this disease has the ability to severely manipulate cognition and emotion in human hosts. Not only that, but its ability to manipulate the host's physiology is seemingly unrivaled in modern day disease. Look, I usually gotta give humans a whole mess of drugs for them to rip off their own forearm meat and not bleed. So, something is special about this ocean cum rash. We also get our last nail in the coffin on the whole allergic reaction theory. Cause after a whole bunch of antihistamines and liver king juice, our boy is still a big old red tumor. Evidently, after the initial examination, they brought the sheriff in to question this guy, cause you know, he murdered his whole family just a little bit. From this interview, we learned that this disease can manipulate his thoughts and behavior completely. Not only that, but by listening to the pulsual's murderous intent and bathing in the blood of others, one receives a euphoric bliss unlike any other available to mankind. Finally, I've been looking for a new drug! Not only can this disease control every facet of its host, it seems like the sores themselves are conscious, allowing them to target Dr. Wells in hopes of infecting him. The thing is, if this thing could projectile attack goo, why was he struggling to produce fluid for a sample? I think that this was the disease defending itself from discovery, or at least delaying it for as long as possible. In response to his condition, Wells gave him a bunch of Xanax or something to sedate him. So whenever you want a Xanax, just start oozing. Anyways, this didn't work because he fucking exploded, which did in fact make me giggle. Now that we know more about what we're dealing with, let's ask the questions that have gone unanswered. What in the hell was that aquatic critter with the infectious cum? This is why you wear condoms. They aren't just for babies. Remember, STDs are much worse. You can always get rid of a baby. It's likely that this creature expels some sort of substance unlike anything seen by modern medicine before. And chances are, this is something not even modern science has ever seen before. Whatever the white goo was, it contained an intelligent pathogen that's capable of spreading from person to person. As infections rise, the violent tendencies this disease tends to inspire will have more wide-reaching implications. And unfortunately, I believe this is only the beginning of what this disease can do. The only thing that can really let us know is if more tapes come to light. St. Roche, Quarantine File 4 The second alert was issued on January 11th, 1998, at 8.15pm on all channels in southeast Louisiana. It premiered 24 hours after the first was broadcasted. The alert followed the previous video until it was later updated. Regional Alert 2 Primary Entry Point System issued an emergency action notification. Alert! A dangerous pathogen has been identified in St. Roche and the surrounding areas. Any and all precautions are advised. The situation is ongoing, and the public will be updated as new information is learned. Residents inside the town of St. Roche and the surrounding communities are under a mandatory quarantine. Anyone breaking the quarantine will be arrested. Anyone believed to be infected will be executed on site. Do not leave your home until military personnel can escort you to safety. Repeat, do not leave your home until military personnel can escort you to safety. It is vital that the infection be avoided at all costs. The pathogen is believed to be highly contagious. Infected individuals can be identified by open sores found all over the body. Transmission from the pathogen is delivered through a white mucus secreted from the sores. Symptoms of the itch. 1. Cysts develop on the skin between 3 to 4 hours. 2. Cysts open within 4 to 5 hours. 3. Infected will develop a severe itchy sensation. 4. Infected will try to feed the open sore's blood and fluid to stop the itchy sensation. Warning: Do not go near the infected dead. They are still highly infectious and extremely dangerous. An infected corpse still secretes the infectious mucus. Some reports have indicated that an infected corpse can explode, infecting anybody in a 30-foot radius. If infected, you can try to sever the infected area and burn the appendage. Otherwise, at the moment, there is no cure. If severing appendage is not possible, lock yourself up until military personnel can reach you. Your safety is important to us. Your safety is important to us? <laughs> yeah, I've heard that one before. Try as you might, you can't keep me safe from myself. In this tape, a few more key pieces of information come to light. For instance, we learned that the dead are infectious. I, I know it'll be difficult considering you watch this show, but everyone try not to get cummed on by a dead person for a little while. 
Likely, the explosion we witnessed in Scott's case is the pathogen's last-ditch attempt to infect others by spreading infectious carrion as far as it can go via explosion. Like blowing on a dandelion so it pollinates, or dynamiting a whale to clear the beach and also so it rains delicious endangered rotten beluga blubber. We also learn that if infected, one can amputate the infected area in attempts to save themselves. Look, I get it, we may know why my crotch is itchy now. But if that's the case, do me a favor and just have the military go ahead and kill me. This amputation method is significant because prior to this, touching the white goo that isn't cum but a different white goo was a death sentence. The authorities seem to be taking this outbreak quite seriously, as having entire body herpes is now how you get yourself a shoot on sight order. A pointer, if you're gonna execute someone on sight, is there really purpose to telling them that? I feel like if they know, they're gonna try to avoid it. But hey, you don't tell me how to make my videos, I'm not gonna tell you how to execute your citizens. My advice if you get itchy hole disease, don't lock yourself in the closet and go ahead and feed the holes. I say this because I'm curious about one aspect of this story that is yet unanswered. What happens if someone successfully feeds the holes on their body for a long period of time? Does the disease progress? Do they get more powerful? Maybe it becomes some sort of super mutant itch. I have no idea, but I've been talking about this too long, so we're gonna go on to the next tape. The following is Melissa Bates' first-hand account of her encounter with Mr. Griffin. St. Roche Quarantine File 5, St. Roche Hospital, Infectious Disease Ward, January 8th, 1998. Patient, Melissa Bates. I could tell Mr. Griffin was sick from the moment he stumbled into the gas station. I thought he might have been having a heart attack when he collapsed to the floor. I had to go help him. You know, the right thing. I didn't even notice the bumps until I was helping him to his feet. The poor man looked like he was in pain. His skin was so hot. It was like he walked out of an oven. And that's when I heard something pop. I could feel something wet in my hand. At first, I thought it was blood, but it was too gritty to be blood. It was wet, but it was rough, like sand and it was white and yellow like snot. Before I could even look at what it was, I heard more pops. Every one of them just exploded. More of whatever it was got on me, and everyone else in the store. It was shooting out of him like bullets. It was disgusting. And after that, Mr. Griffin snapped too. He rushed out of the place like a bat out of hell, almost like nothing had happened. I went to the bathroom and washed that nasty gunk off my hand. Then I thought nothing of it until I got home. That's when I found my hand covered in hives. Later that night, it was all over my body. I started to itch. Bad. My entire body felt like it was covered in acid, but worse. I tried to take a shower and rubbed every lotion I could find on my skin. Nothing worked. Chris. Oh god. Poor Chris. He was my boyfriend. He asked me if I was okay. He was just trying to be sweet, but for some reason, I grabbed a knife. The next thing I remember, I was rubbing his blood all over my body. I was feeding them. The holes. The things inside of them. And I need to keep feeding them too. If I don't, I think I'm gonna die. Can you help me? Please. Melissa Bates passed away two days later. For more information on the patients exposed to the Omega helmets at the St. Roche gas station, please visit subsequent files. <laughs> she looks like Swiss cheese. Well, Melissa Bates bit the dust, but it didn't specify whether or not she exploded. I hope she did, because I think it'd be funny. Good rule of thumb, the right thing to do morally is typically the wrong thing to do survivally. It appears that this was among the first infected by our patient Zero. With Miss Bates' case, we understand notably more about this disease. First and foremost, we get confirmation that these sores can manipulate the mental state of the individuals and cause some sort of amnesia during the violent incidents. Not only that, but we get a major clue in what's causing this disease. Melissa claimed that the fluid felt grainy, almost as if there were little balls in there that she could feel in between her fingers. She also claimed that there was something inside the holes, and I think the nodules in the cum are the eggs of whatever the something inside those holes are. The name of this disease, Omega Helminths, which I was mispronouncing by the way, Omega, for the final letter of the Greek alphabet, sometimes used to represent the end of something, or infinity, and Helminth, aka parasitic worms. This name likely signifies that there are worms inside of the holes of the skin. These parasites are likely the cause of the rash and mental manipulation. I wonder if there are any other parasitic worms we know of. Maybe, oh I don't know, from the same creator and in the same analog horror universe? I think that these skin worms could be tangentially related to the tangy worms. See what I did there? Yes you do, you little shit! In this world, it seems that there may be an evolutionary tree of life of mind-controlling brain worms. 
It appears that this family of parasites has much more than one branch. Oh, they can have a friend! Only time will tell what this means for the world, but more importantly, the greater Louisiana area. The following content is for authorized forensic agents from the Department of Counterintelligence and Threat Analysis. Any public performance, copying, or other use is strictly prohibited. Anomalous abduction cases. You are assigned to review three classified cases. Retrieve details from designated secure channels and submit your comprehensive report within the designated time frame. Maintain utmost confidentiality. Case file number 059272. Name Eugene Wilkins. Age 31. Sex male. Cause of death acute hemorrhage. Medical notes not applicable. Eugene's body was discovered in a patch of grass two miles from the town of Classified, Pennsylvania. The individual has been reported missing three days prior to his body being found by the local authorities. Eugene stopped showing up to work and did not answer phone calls made by his company. The details regarding the state in which the body was found are not for the faint of heart. Eugene was subject to surgical mutilation. Victim's eyes were removed, along with the teeth and tongue. The organs and muscles have been extracted from the body leaving behind a peel of skin and bones. No incisions observed. No sign of blunt trauma or puncture wounds. All blood has been drained from the victim's body. No traces of footprints nor blood spills to be found in the area. Investigators speculate that organs and muscles have been extracted with unusual and completely unnatural instruments. Toxicologists found no sign of anesthesia during the time the injuries were inflicted. No signs of restraint or coercion in the victim. Illustration of Eugene's corpse. Case file, number 011537. Name, Maria Bishop. Age, 21. Sex, female. Cause of death, suffocation. Medical notes, mild OCD. Maria's body was discovered by a local farmer underneath a light post in the highway of classified Tennessee. The victim's parents contacted local authorities after no communication for eight days. She was last seen in a gas station, six miles from the place her body was found. Stella Davis, the clerk at Classified, was the last person to have seen Maria alive. Stella recalls Maria's strange behavior. Further investigation needed. She bought laxatives, chocolates, sleeping pills, and cigarettes. She took the items and left hurriedly. It seemed like she was running away from someone. The victim's body underwent extreme physical contortion and stretching. Investigation is to be further conducted to determine the cause of elongated limbs. The force required to create such damage and fractures is extremely high, much more than a car crash. No external wounds found. Apart from rigor mortis, the body was covered head to toe with a yellowish substance, similar to motor oil. The origin of this substance is unclear. As with previous case, blood has been drained from the body and organs removed. Although bones present acute fractures, the official cause of death is asphyxia. Illustration of Maria's corpse. Case file, number 096173. Name, unidentified. Age, late 40s. Sex, male. Cause of death, chest trauma. Medical notes, unknown. At 0200 EST, 10 miles from the classified county, a local hunter, Edwards, witnessed an incident over the classified hill. Upon overhearing screams of help echoing into the dark of the fields, Edwards ran towards the location. He witnessed a mysterious triangular object hovering 30 feet above the ground. A man was dangling mid-air with metallic cables wrapped around his body. As soon as Edwards approached, a click was heard, and the man was dragged away from sight. The metallic triangle had no resemblance to any modern vehicle. It silently shot up into the dark skies, vanishing from sight. Illustration of the Unidentified Flying Object The hunter called the authorities, and soon a group performed a search scouring every inch of ground in the abduction area. They stopped after four hours. Edwards was interrogated for three days until the remains of the man were discovered five miles from the state of the abduction. The man's body had been subject to gruesome mutilation in a manner that subsequent investigations never encountered before. Victim had been found with no limbs. Only the torso and half his head were present. The face was contorted beyond recognition. His limbs were nowhere to be found. Blood had been drained from the body through two symmetrical orifices in the chest. Investigators determined wounds were caused by advanced instruments with stunning precision. These instruments acted as drainage holes. Half of the victim's head is missing. The mouth cavity and internal thorax had been extracted. The edges of the cuts are uniform to their size. 
illustration of an unidentified man's corpse. Holy shit! Some sort of alien life forms abducting humans and using unrecognizable technology to mutilate their bodies in seemingly impossible ways for what I assume are research purposes, but they could also just be pulling the cosmic equivalent of burning ants with a magnifying glass. I told you the news wasn't just using aliens to make everyone get distracted and shut up about how they're just fear-mongering pieces of shit like they do every two years on the dot. Let's break down what we know, starting with case one. First off, the aliens seem to have some sort of giant suck machine. We need to acquire it immediately, for research purposes. Why are you looking at me like that? Evidently, this machine can extract any organ or part of the body through the skin without puncturing any holes. This is something that human medical practices are far from capable from. I don't know, maybe they just pull them out through the mouth or the ass. Not only this, but the toxicology reports confirm that these aliens also have a completely novel system of suspending their subjects unrelated to drugs. Maybe it's some sort of hypnosis or a really good incentive, like tying them to a bench. What's incentive mean? In the second case, a few more notable things come to light. First off, Maria was acting erratically and seemingly running from something, but I find it hard to believe that aliens let her get away. Maybe they're stupid. I don't know. There's a wide range of intelligence with humans too. I don't know how Maria would fend off aliens with all that crap she bought, so maybe everyone was just having an off day. Inevitably, Maria was fed through the same suck machine, and her limb bones were contorted like she was some sort of human Rubik's Cube. She was also covered in some sort of liquid that tastes pretty bad. So this tells us two things. These aliens might just be getting their rocks off in a fucked up way, and I need to get tested. That was a stupid joke. Finally, on to the third case. An unidentified man was eaten by a sky triangle. Hey, I, I saw like a man get sucked up into the uh, sky triangle or something. Everyone, stop looking for the serial killer. We have something more important to do. He then came back with no arms or legs or half his face. Oh yeah, and he had his blood drained from two small incisions on his chest, which is weird because couldn't they just use the suck machine? I don't know, I'm not an alien. I'm not complaining because now that guy, he's got a free stussy. So what does all this mean? I don't know. To be honest, your species is being abducted by multiple aliens all the time. You're easy targets and fun to pick on. These just happen to be a bit more sadistic and heretofore unknown. It's unknown whether these will be the last abductions that take place, and only time will tell if this is a recurring problem. At any rate, it seems impossible to discern a pattern with only three victims thus far. And maybe if this analog horror series comes out with another installment, we can see if there's more to this mystery. Also, I know this is unrelated, but how weird is it that all of the towns, businesses, and locations all happen to be named classified? I hear classified is beautiful this time of year. This is Brie. She's 17, and she's vulnerable. This is Michael. He feeds off vulnerability. You see, Michael wanted to bring unity and help people, so he was thinking, and he decided to make a cult. First, Michael met Brie. Brie was a confused girl. She had no hope, no family, no money, no place to stay. But worst of all, she had no purpose. But that's okay. Michael would help. Michael created a group and taught them about Christ. He told Bree if she joined this group that she would find the truth in God, a loving group of people, money to provide herself with, and a place to stay at the church as well. But most importantly, he told Bree that she would finally have a purpose. So Bree did some thinking, and Bree said yes. She joined the church and moved in with the members here. She made loving friends, learned to pray, enjoyed nice meals with everyone, and had joyful conversations. But most importantly, Bree found God. She was finally happy. Then one night, while Brie was sleeping, she had a bad dream. A church member came into her room without permission to harm her and do vile things. It actually wasn't a dream. Because of what had happened, Brie was traumatized. She was stabbed in the back by one of her own members from the church. Brie was sad and angry that God could let something so vile happen. But Michael told Brie if she had believed harder, this wouldn't have happened. He told Brie she needed to put her trust in God more and pray more to make things right for her sins. So Brie prayed. She prayed and 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 prayed, but she was still pregnant. Nine months later, she gave birth to a beautiful baby boy named Richard. After she had Richard, Brie had a hard time not seeing the face of the man who had hurt her within her own child. She tried to love Richard, but it was just so hard, even though it was a sin.
Bree repented for her sins. Here at Bright Future Church, where we want everyone to find God and be saved. Join, Join us. us. Bro, is she gonna eat the fucking baby? I sure hope so. Holy shit! A cult organization led by an egotistical monster in which an unprosecuted assault took place, leading to a pregnancy of a baby boy that may be in danger of being reconsumed by the mother in question. While I thought Bree did in fact eat the infant like a chicken nugget, they appear to just be intrusive thoughts. For now. This analog horror refers to a system of power that has been used historically to manipulate and abuse those who fall under them. That of cults and abusive religions. Cults historically prey on people who feel listless and without purpose, or with nowhere left to go. Bree checked all those boxes, so of course she would get snapped up by this cult. Cult-like organizations often use religion as a backing. Religion is a pretty good listen to me or else, because the or else is like getting boiled forever or some shit. Combine that with the fact that you don't really need to prove anything you say, and it's pretty Pretty clear how abuse becomes so rampant in these hierarchical structures where one leader basically speaks for God. Hey, I had an idea. I think maybe we should all have some power. That way we could have checks and balances and we wouldn't have to worry about someone committing atrocities and not receiving any repercussions for terrible acts. God said no. Okay. God also says now you go jail. He works in mysterious ways. This cult specifically uses Christianity as a way to justify any horrors within. Unfortunately, unlike Michael suggested, you can't just click your heels three times and ask for God to put you back in Kansas and also make you not pregnant anymore. Because of this, Brie gave birth to Richard. Happy birthday! Although, the birthday probably wasn't all that happy, because if the face of your baby is a dead ringer for the man that assaulted you, that's what we like to call in the business a less than ideal deal situation. But it's okay that Brie has intrusive thoughts of cannibalizing her own baby, because she said sorry to God, and then God said it was okay. Just remember, if you ever have thoughts of doing something inhumane, or if you do something inhumane, just say sorry to God, and everything will be okay, regardless of what you did or who you hurt. You know, when you phrase it like that, I can kind of get into this whole God thing. This analog horror is part of a larger series, and through examining the rest of the entries, we may be able to get a sense of the full picture. And also, if Richard gets eaten. This video is simply me analyzing and dipping my toe into the first entry. And if it interests you guys, I'll come back and cover the whole thing. You know how I do, I fuck around and I find out, and once I find out, it tells me how I should go about fucking around in the future. Disclaimer, this video contains violent and disturbing content. Epilepsy warning. Tape 1. Faces. Six months ago, police found three paintings stored away in an abandoned storage area, each titled after recent murders. First victim was Carla Gray, found with 36 stab wounds to the face and all of her teeth removed. On the back of the first painting, the title, Carla's Teeth, was written. This is the painting. Second victim was Jackie Graham, found drowned with 27 stab wounds in the perineum. She was alive during the stabbing. Her painting is titled, Floating Jackie. This is the painting. Last victim was James Miller, found with his face torn off and his wrist slit open. Autopsy showed that James was alive for several days without a face. The third painting was named, James' Secret Face. This is the painting. Two months later, several more paintings were discovered. However, the titles of these paintings did not seem to be connected to any known cases at the time. Here are the other paintings, and their titles. Wax Doll Tom. Lisa's Secret Face. Hanging Jimmy. Toy Cory. Daniel After the Fire. Jennifer's Last Stare. Scream, Maggie. Scream. After going public with the case, and sharing the paintings in hopes of saving anyone that may be depicted, the police received three photos in the mail. All of them are also titled. The photos appear to depict the victims, James Miller, Jackie Graham, and Jimmy. If anyone knows anything about these photos or paintings, please contact 985-455-9560. One final painting titled, Self-Portrait, was found two days ago. This is the painting. 
Holy shit. Some sort of hyper artistic serial killer leaving breadcrumbs to his identity in the form of portraits and paintings. Well, Ferb, I know what we're gonna do today. Think he takes commissions? Oh, sweet, another tape. Tape two, Lighthouse. Four weeks ago, a police officer named Bill Collins went missing along with his wife and two daughters. Bill had previously discovered this painting in his home, clueless to how it could have ended up there. While searching Bill's house, the police found one of his daughters hanging by the neck from the ceiling in the attic. She was only two months old. The Collins family car was found 12 days later by the oceanside. In the car, the police found a painting titled, The Long-Necked Angel. Angel was indeed the name of the youngest daughter found in the attic. This is the painting. The search would lead to an old lighthouse standing just a few miles away from the abandoned car. The lighthouse hadn't been in use for several years. On the door to the lighthouse, an abstract face was painted in red. This is the painting. Inside, the charred corpse of a missing teenager named Daniel Williams was found. Police later proceeded into the tunnels under the lighthouse. Here, the police would find two more corpses belonging to Jennifer White and her daughter, Lisa White. They had been missing for several months. Lastly, the police found a moist barrel emitting a foul stench. The barrel was filled with mangled meat and bones. Tests later showed that it belonged to the rest of the Collins family. The tests also showed extreme volumes of amphetamine. Photos of the Collins family moments before death were found scattered about the barrel. Here are the photos. Lastly, there was a fourth photo, depicting an unknown face. My god, those poor people. I can't even begin to imagine what that's like. Missing something like that? Someone's gotta call the rest of the Collins family and tell them that we found their barrel full of mangled meat and bones. Oh, I get it. This is definitely the same guy. If this isn't the same guy, he looks enough like the same guy to get identified as this guy. I know I mistake humans for one another a lot, but you all have two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, so excuse me if this isn't exactly the f***ing same for most of you and you're just tuned into your own small differences. It's obvious that this killer is a bit of an artist, and he likes to document his crimes using his favorite mediums. Painting and photography. There's evil, and then there's killing a baby and painting it to look like a penis evil. Tape 3. In the walls. Ten days ago, the Beck twins went missing. Five days later, their bodies were discovered inside an abandoned paper mill factory. However, the state of the bodies were found in a gruesome condition. Only the upper body of Margaret and the lower body of Corey could be located. The twins' bodies had been sewn together in a sloppy manner. The rest of their bodies have still not been found. Margaret's neck and jaw was broken in several places. A clay brick had been violently shoved down her throat. The word meat had been written on the brick. Corey's genitalia had been removed by a pulling force. One week before their disappearance, Corey had been dared by two of his friends to spend an hour in a remote cabin near Tiger Lake. Allegedly, Corey went inside alone with his digital camera while his friends waited outside. After just four minutes, Corey ran out screaming that he had seen a face. According to his friends, Corey's left arm was badly bruised. While investigating the cabin, police found a wardrobe connected to a crawl space inside the walls. Corey's camera was found on the floor inside this open wall cavity. This is what was on the camera. This face is believed to be connected to the disappearance of Corey and Margaret Beck. If you recognize this person, please contact 985-455-9560. Yup, same guy. Told ya! This is one hell of a serial killer, but what do you expect from a species so badass it destroys its own ecosystem? Also, is, uh, is F***toy Cory the same Cory? Because we now know that this guy is like 11. So I mean, like, I guess we already knew that this guy belongs in jail, but I didn't know the degree to which he belongs in jail. You know what they say, kid diddlers are always the first to die in jail. Besides that, a few things come to mind. One, Corey has bad friends. Two, our killer definitely has some sort of art house message he wants to get out by using people's bodies as a medium. Like ripping off Corey's balls and shoving a labeled brick down someone's throat. All I'm saying is, he took the time to label the brick. Three, the amount of evil it takes to sew one half of a former living creature to another is irredeemable. I mean, what kind of sick, twisted monster? Why are you guys looking at me like that? 
So I'm thinking as like a joke, I would pretend to be his lawyer and say, Your Honor, if you are what you eat, my client is an innocent man. Tape 4. The Clue. Private investigator Sean Kane has been helping police locate victims connected to several paintings. The last body he found before his disappearance was the body of Tom Harris. The killer had climbed the drain pipe up to the third floor and entered Tom's apartment through his bedroom window. In the living room, a pile of hardened candle wax was found. Inside this pile of wax was the body of Tom Harris. The cause of death was suffocation from the wax. Tom's arms and eyelids had been cut off. A third arm could be found inside the pile of wax. We still do not know who this arm belongs to. Tom Harris. One week later, investigator Sean went missing from his home. Neighbors of Sean notified police after hearing his dog bark for over nine hours. Inside, police found a horrid scene. The dog's legs had all been broken. Although dehydrated and suffering, she was still alive. Blood trails could be found leading from the bedroom to the kitchen. The only clue police could find was that Sean seemed to have deliberately painted the number two on the doorframe with his own blood. Inside Sean's bedroom, police found a newly titled painting, clearly resembling Sean, the man in the pipes. The perpetrator had entered Sean's house through the basement. Luckily, Sean had a surveillance camera installed just a few days earlier. Even though the camera had been destroyed, it still caught a photo of the perpetrator. This is the photo. See, I was worried until that big old smile. He's a happy guy. He wouldn't hurt us. That's what smile means, right? I'm still figuring out humans, but I'm like 75% sure we don't have to worry about this guy anymore. It's not like any more episodes could get released that fill in the questions we have now while still raising more questions in a spine-tingling and enthralling way to keep us watching. It seems to me that we've just found Waxed All Tom. Editing human slave here that's totally wearing clothes and not in a dark corner, we also found Daniel after the fire. The victim that corresponds to a portrait of the same name revealed in the first tape. Also, alongside Wax Doll Tom is another unidentified arm. He probably left a snack in case Tom got hungry, which is pretty thoughtful. We just all gotta keep our eyes out for a portrait labeled One-Armed Willie. There's gotta be some sort of reason that he keeps doing this in elaborate ways and documenting it artistically. You know what they say, one man's phobia is another man's fetish. With the addition of this new tape, we can piece together a preliminary story about the case thus far. It appears that a serial killer is murdering people, no shit, and then creating horrific and distorted portraits of his victims. He also seems to enjoy photographing his victims, making sculptures out of them, and is aware that the police are actively investigating him. Whoever this is, is also seemingly playing a game with law enforcement. He left his self-portrait in incriminating positions and sent photos directly to the police. We're not dealing with a regular killer here. They may call it serial killing. I call it having that dog in me. This means this man may have some sort of message that he thinks is worth the risk of exposing his identity and possibly himself. Or maybe the real serial killer was the friends we made along the way. I feel as though there may not be enough information yet to tell us completely. Or maybe I'm just an idiot. I don't know. He's also murdering people and making funhouse mirror images of their faces using paint. So there's a decent chance he's just f***ing crazy. I I don't know. Who knows? Maybe some other tape will come to light which illuminates some more things. There certainly are a lot of unexplained paintings. Three days ago, Tina Rosenberg was reported missing, along with her boyfriend and younger sister. Her boyfriend, Jack Stryker, wanted to take Tina on a South Coast road trip for her 20th birthday. Flora Rosenberg, the younger sister of Tina, was also invited on this road trip. Jack, Tina, Flora. Jack's car was found two days ago in the woods. There were signs of struggle inside the car. There was also a painting, Flower Face Flora. After searching the car, police heard screaming from deeper within the woods. Police followed the screams until they found a grisly sight. Tina was found tied to a tree with her feet and arms cut off. She was still alive and conscious. The mutilated corpse of Flora Rosenberg could also be located. Her head had been smashed in with a hammer. Tina told the police that the murderer was still around somewhere. However, no one could be found. After escorting Tina from the scene, the police returned to the car and found another painting. The painting had just been put there. The title, Long Jack, hastily written on the back. This is the painting. Jack has still not been found. 
In Tina's own words, this is what happened that night. I remember waking up in the car. Jack was gone, and I could hear someone approaching. Next thing I remember, I I was tied to that tree. I was injected with something. I could hear my sister screaming. She was screaming for our mom. Oh, Flora. I don't know. I remember whispering in her face. Oh, God. Her face. This is a police sketch of the murderer based on Tina's description. Holy shit! This is the first victim that our killer has left alive. While some might state that leaving a witness suggests that our killer is getting overconfident and perhaps a bit sloppy, I would argue that this is very clearly on purpose, and our killer is yet again toying with the police. Think about it. She was injected and tied up. The painting wasn't left at the scene until after the police took her away and came back. These are calculated moves, not disorganized mistakes. From this witness, we found out that he gives, at least in this one instance, drugs to his victims via injections. I'm the cool guy with the drugs around here. Using this information, I would advise that the human investigators test the other bodies for foreign substances. We also haven't found Jack Stryker, so that brings total missing slash rumored body count up to seven. For a total rumored body count of around 17. I don't, I don't know, it's at least close to 17. I actually don't know how to count above 15. Still missing thus far are Lisa's secret face, Hanging Jimmy, Jennifer's last stare, Bremblow's prolapse, Scream Maggie's scream, Sean, aka the man in the pipes. Oh wait, you, yeah, we just found the arm. That arm from Waxdoll Tom. I just realized mid-recording, we found the arm. That's one of the lady's arms. So we're still missing one arm, but we found the arm. Editing human slave here, totally not tied up in some dark room. I'm not sure the timeline adds up, but you know. Found an arm. And half of Corey and half of Margaret Beck, which I'm just gonna count as one. Is that f***ed up? I mean, I'm not gonna start drawing lines now. It's a bit late for that. Also, it's two total when you factor in the addition of the other one made out of their other halves, so it's just easier this way. If you had any shadow of a doubt about who this guy is, you were an idiot in the first place but now even more so. This killer has been identified by the same physical characteristics every time without fail. Massive black pits of pupils filled with a crazed dark energy, a vacant, somehow threatening stare, stringy dark hair, and sharp, jagged, emotionless features. Our killer is still somewhere out there, doing things like taking pictures of Tina's severed feet, angling it so that they don't look cut off to sell to perverts on the internet. Absolutely devious. As for the strange message that I hinted this killer might be trying to show through his crimes in the last video, I believe that leaving a witness alive in this strange and nauseating fashion suggests there's more to this than just murder for murder's sake. If he's able to evade law enforcement this effectively, our killer is not an idiot. If he was just killing to kill, he would cover his tracks as best as possible. But he doesn't. No, he wants the opposite. He draws attention to his crimes. He wants people to see this. But why? I feel like the answer is right in front of me, but I just can't see it. As for what he's trying to say, I'm still drawing a blank. If you have theories, put them in the comments below to help solve this, because I'm very likely just stupid. Although, I feel I can say with 100% certainty now that he wants as much attention on his atrocities as possible. And careful planning of his crime suggests that it's for a deeper meaning rather than inflating a sick ego. This is all I can really gauge thus far, and we may have to wait for more information before this is solvable. Former police officer Ian Ford and his wife May were recently reported missing. When police went to their farm to investigate, they found an awful stench coming from the barn. Inside, they found the brutalized corpse of May Ford. She had been handcuffed to a pole inside one of the stalls. However, her hands had been ripped right off. Even though her body had been badly mangled, tests showed that she died from internal bleeding. A dead horse could be found within the same stall. The cause of death was heart failure due to a sildenafil overdose. Inside the milk house, police found a bloody mattress. Sildenafil citrate was found scattered around the mattress, along with used bandages and packets of penicillin. Someone had been sleeping here for some time. The decapitated head of the Ford's granddaughter was found wrapped in a blanket, the head of Fiona Ford. The worst smell came from within the second stall of the barn. Several faces were found nailed to the walls inside of the stall. Some of them belonged to previous victims, malformed beyond recognition. There were also several decapitated pig carcasses. In the middle of the stall lay an abnormally large pig. Its belly had been sliced open and then stitched together again. Stuffed inside the pig carcass, the police found the corpse of Ian Ford. The pig's eyes had been cut out and replaced with the eyes of Fiona Ford. Inside the back room, police found the rest of Fiona's body, 
along with several disturbing paintings. These paintings depict Fiona, Ian, and May, along with an alarming amount of other victims. Be warned, these images may be very distressing. Here are the paintings and their titles. Breeding Mount May, Wet Skin George, The Jigsaw Baby, Ian the Pig, Blowhole Isabel, Hide and Zeke, Four Holes Fiona, Breathless Janice, Fleshhead Fred, Tina the Waitress, Observing Paul. If you know who any of these people could be, please contact 985-455-9560. A heavily damaged tape was found in the mud outside the barn. Even though the tape was almost completely destroyed, police were able to recover some of the footage. This is what was on the tape. Holy shit! Do you know what this means? Cause I don't. Let's get this out of the way. Sildafinil or whatever the fuck is another name for Viagra, aka boner pills. Mine works fine, I know from googling it smartass. Feel free to comment it anyway, engagement is engagement. This means he was giving boner pills to a horse. Obviously enough to make it overdose and die is enough to make it hard. So let me put these pieces together for you. The painting was called Breeding Mount May. She died from internal bleeding five feet away from a horse that died of a Viagra overdose. Is this killer using a horse to fuck people to death? Cause there is no cock like horse cock. That's kind of hilarious. Like it wouldn't be if it was real, but because this is just an analog horror, it, it, come on. It's funny enough that I say we just let him go. Like I thought I was making a sick joke before I realized it's what actually happened. Let's move on from this, because I could make horse dick jokes for hours, but that's not what you guys clicked for. Wait, is it? I never know with you guys, because it might be. Next up, we got the several faces that have been stapled to the walls. I really like, um, how you decorated your house. These belong to several victims that have been defaced that we know about, and likely a few others. Okay guys, be on the lookout for someone with no face. I was gonna draw a depiction of their face to help, but, um... You know, that's kind of a moot point, so everybody just be on the lookout for this still watermarked stock image of a raw steak. The killer now has switched to primarily targeting cops and their families. Bold move. Also, let's talk about how he stuffed one pig inside of another. See what I did there, cause he's a cop? Don't know why he replaced the eyes of the pig with Fiona's eyes? It's likely something related to his strange art house style message that he may or may not be trying to put out there. Don't exactly know what that's supposed to say, but he definitely got creative with it. Also, um, from Four Holes Fiona, it's very likely that he was, um, using eye holes for something that eye holes aren't usually used for. Yeah. At least I don't have to say she'd never unsee it. I heard of somebody I fucking, but this is ridiculous. This video would not be complete without examining the new paintings. As is his MO, he depicts each of his brutal acts in gory and cartoonish forms. Also, after counting above 10, which I'm very proud of, this adds 11 more victims to our total body count. 11 more paintings. So basically, wherever this killer is, people would just be disappearing left and right. Like deadass, you would have a labor shortage at this point. Either the police are idiots, or the man is just ungodly good at hide and seek. Finally, let's take a look at our killer, the Homicide Unit's number one special boy, future death row inmate of the month, yes he is, yes he is. Here's our goober, his mouth is stinted open at the sides by staples. I just thought this was notable, and wanted to make sure you're learning and having fun. Also, was he saying something on the tape? Unfortunately, there aren't any clues in the closed captions, and I couldn't decipher anything. This is the moment in which I call upon the masses to do my work for me. Come on, figure it out. There is one thing that many of you have not noticed upon first watch. I certainly didn't. There's likely Morse code in this video. I don't know how to read Morse code, 
nor can I extract it past the music and send it through a translator. I don't know where every message is exactly, but I've found examples of it. If anyone can decipher the message under the music, please leave your finding in the comments below. The following are moments where I believe the Morse code to be. 2, 12. 2, 29. 3, 06. Good luck, soldiers, and yes, I do have the authority to assign you homework, suck it. I feel as though there is some sort of message in these killings. And maybe the codes are the clue. Hmm. Over the past few days, there have been numerous gruesome murder reports. One of the victims was the elementary school teacher, Isabel Jackson. Isabel called 911 in the midst of her attack. However, the address she provided led police to a completely different crime scene. The address belonged to a family of three, Janice, Paul, and their son, Zeke. They were expecting a daughter in a few months. Right outside their home, police found a bloodied garden shear. What awaited the police inside the house was so shocking and repulsive that one of the officers requested a period of leave from duty the next day. Janice and Paul's bodies were found in the kitchen, both ruthlessly executed. The fetus had been violently cut out from Janice's stomach. Janice was then strangled to death with the umbilical cord. Paul was found dead a few feet away from Janice, tied to the kitchen counter with his mouth sewn shut. The fetus was found in pieces, scattered all around the house. During autopsy, they found the head of the fetus shoved down Paul's throat. He died from asphyxiation, choking on his own unborn daughter. Zeke is still missing. Inside the house, there was also a painting. Its title had been painted over, except for the word, Pipes. This is the painting. Police later managed to track down the real address of Isabel Jackson, although they were too late. The headless body of Bruce Jackson was found right by the open door. He had been stabbed in his chest seven times. Where one would expect to find his head, a painting lay instead. It was titled, Infinite Ma Bruce. This is the painting. Isabel was found murdered inside the bathroom. The lock to the door had been completely destroyed by a hammer drill. Isabel suffered multiple skull fractures, and a hole was drilled directly through her frontal lobe. A rolled up note had been put inside of the hole. The note read, I live where I can't breathe, and I eat without teeth. What am I? A pivotal clue emerged at the crime scene, unraveling new possibilities in the investigation. The presence of two sets of footprints in the blood suggests that there was more than one culprit. The police now firmly believe that whoever is behind these paintings and murders does not work alone. As for why Isabel gave the address leading to another murder scene is still a mystery. Isabel's 911 call stands as one of the most disturbing calls ever recorded. Warning. What you are about to hear may be very distressing. He's back! Real quick, if you haven't seen my other videos about the analog horror series from Urban Spook, covering the videos Faces, In the Walls, The Clue, The Lighthouse, The Witness, and Pigs, 
go check them and the original videos out, because this will be confusing without context. If you're not going to do that because you're a butthole, here's an oversimplified rundown. A serial killer has been murdering people and documenting his crimes using paintings and photography as a medium. He has continued to do this even when his investigation was publicized and gained media attention, and began to toy with and even murder the people investigating him. Even to the point that he got a horse to fuck the wife of a policeman to death. Some people think that this killer may be trying to send a message with his brutal murders. And that, people, is me. As it stands, he is still an active killer, and there are many paintings out there depicting victims that are still unaccounted for. Got it? Good. The next chapter of this story adds two separate double homicides, as well as one forced fetus flush, to use the monetizable term. And they're all connected. Isabel and Bruce Jackson, as well as Paul and Janice, and their baby-to-be, were all turned into art house worm food. This also adds one kidnapping and probable murder, that of their son Zeke. Other than these crimes, the new installment details some very important evidence in the case of the painter, or should I say, the painters. Two sets of different footprints heavily suggest that there are two killers. Also, the amount of work done in these elaborate crime scenes seems too difficult to be carried out by only one individual. I know I said there was one killer and that you were an idiot for seeing these pictures and saying it could be more than one, but you see, you're still the idiot for believing an idiot like me. One of the most pressing questions I have is why did the address of the second crime scene come from the victims of the first murders? It's a big old game of musical crime scenes. Our killers could have possibly murdered the family first, then moved the bodies to Isabel's house before murdering her and her husband, then made the escape with the two other bodies. The chances are slim for this one, but this is a killer that typically escapes long odds. It's also possible the killers drugged these victims like they have before, and they could have kidnapped and transported them. In their intoxicated state, it's possible that they would believe that they were home. These are all guesses that are stupidly convoluted, and therefore probably wrong. We don't know how he did it, but the question is, why? I think this killer could know something that we don't. Perhaps this baby was the product of infidelity, and that's why this killer connected these two crime scenes. This is just a random theory I have, and have little else to back it up. Speaking of, another mystery this installment brings is the note in Isabel's skull. The riddle reads, I live where I can't breathe, and I eat without teeth. What am I? Yeah, I think I know the answer to this one. The horse's name was Friday. The answer is a fetus. Think about it. A fetus lives where it can't breathe, a fluid-filled womb. It eats without teeth through an umbilical cord. It gets everything it needs from its mother. It was also ripped out of the uterus of another woman involved and used to kill her. I don't know what the riddle means in the grander context, but this is the theory I have with the most evidence. This still leaves a few mysteries unanswered. Why is the painting called Pipes? Is it somehow related to the man in the pipes? Or the mini almost person that was shoved up into the daddy's throat pipes? Why did he scatter the fetus around the apartment? And why did he only use the head to choke Paul? Will I ever truly find love? What message is he trying to send? I'm still not sure about any of this. Also, what the hell happened to Zeke? Fans of Urban Spook series will know that the killer totally didn't do anything like cut him in half and sew him to another severed half of a different child or get a horse to kill a Mr. Hand style and probably just let him live and was really nice to him and got him ice cream or something. Finally, there's the police call. As disturbing as it is, I can't really gauge any new information not provided in the text. Although, hearing the drill go into her frontal lobe really tied it together for me with a nice little bow on it. It seems that yet again, the killers have changed their pattern. Instead of going solely for police officers and their families, he seems to be targeting different groups of people in sprees, potentially each for their own reasons. He is still operating in a fashion that seems like he wants attention for this. You don't drill a hole in someone's skull, jam a note with a fetus riddle in there, then kill another family who was pregnant, then lead the police to the second crime scene using the call from the first to not get attention. He's trying to say something. The thing is, exactly what the fuck that something is eludes me. As for what the killers might do next, I don't know, probably kill, idiot. That was each one of the coverages of this series and the story so far. With the help of your previous comments, there are a few things that you taught me that may help us decipher more. Good work, keep it up, no, I'm not paying you. First off, fortunately y'all found Zeke. 
playing a good old-fashioned game of hide-and-seek. Unfortunately, I don't think a human head is supposed to look like that. Also, if these videos suggest chronological order, that means Zeke was alive when he was painted in the episode Pigs. And that means that not everyone who has a portrait is dead yet. If that's the case, some of these may suggest plans for the future. Secondly, the riddle was found in Isabel's blowhole from the painting, which means my fetus theory could be wrong. I think the killers are just calling her fat. God damn, dude absolutely vile. <laughs> it's also quite possible that this riddle has multiple answers, and something tells me that this killer is the artsy type that would put in a double meaning. Finally, the Morse code in pigs. There were a lot of suggestions in the comments, and I don't speak Morse code. Some people said it's I am Bill Collins, some people said it's bullets don't work, and some people said it was <laughs> which I doubt. There hasn't been much consistency, and I'm starting to think you guys can't read Morse code either, or you're just fucking with me. Who would have thought that a YouTube comment section wouldn't be the best place to try and solve a murder. If seeing any of this straight through triggers any theories, let me know though. On planet Earth, life has thrived for millions of years. Big and small have found ways to adapt and evolve to flourish in all types of environments. From barren wastes to lush forests, life can be found. Earth has homed these creatures since the dawn of life itself. Only until very recently, things have changed. Earth has traditionally been home to life that has evolved only within its own ecosystems, until very recently. New life forms have appeared all around the globe, completely changing the balance of nature and the human understanding of the system of evolution. Kinda like that time that you thought the Earth was flat, but then it wasn't, and then you guys murdered the guy who said it was round. The National Living Meat Research Foundation has been created to help study these new species, trying to educate the world about these creatures and what the Foundation calls their wondrous way of life. That's some fine corporate doublespeak you got right there. The new life forms have had an explosive arrival across the globe in 1933. Question 1. Where'd they come from? As with anything, humans can't agree on shit. All the typical suspects come into question. Aliens, demons meant to signify the apocalypse, a new, even fatter type of human. Look how fat I am, I'm just mortified, you guys. Can't believe I- Hey! They just keep coming out with those. They actually come intrinsically from Earth, apparently miraculously out of nowhere. One thing is for certain, Earth is now their home. Welcome home! <laughs> These creatures are composed of muscles, organ tissues, and bones. They greatly resemble mammals without skin, or raw meat, hence their name, Vita Carnes. I, if I pronounce that wrong, I'm sorry, dude. I read it like a second grade level. These creatures survive off of the flesh of other animals. Unlike many naturally evolved Earth life, Vita Carnis organisms generally avoid cannibalizing each other. The Carnis only develop in places of high population. And higher level Carnis life forms can only generate when they're in a high density crawl area. This leads us to the first species. The crawl is a growth of meaty tendrils that closely resemble the small intestine. The only difference being the dark red coloration. These tendrils grow in a similar pattern as vines, mold, or fungi. A primary structure is the host to many other offshoots of tendrils. These testicles tentacles are filled with veins and arteries, as well as vascular systems for the transportation of nutrition. The end of these tendrils are equipped with organelles to absorb water and other organic nutrients necessary for growth. It can also obtain energy via photosynthesis. The crawl thrives in almost all environments, and thus, its recent inclusion in the food chain has had wide-reaching implications on the balance of the ecosystem. Some may assume that the crawl would outcompete native life and lead it to become a dangerous invasive species, leading to complete ecological collapse. On the contrary, in the crawl's unique lifestyle, it drops its tendrils, which decay into a nutrient-rich sludge, making the plants around it not only survive, but thrive. The animals eat the bigger, healthier plants, resulting resulting in a bigger, healthier ecosystem. They can also just straight up eat the delicious, delicious crawl as well. The presence of these animals also leaves poo-poo for the crawl to eat, because it, it's into that, I, I guess. Humans did as humans always do, threw caution to the wind and found things to do with the weird ground intestines. Because of the supernatural rate of growth and richness in nutrients, it has been sustainably cultivated in farms and turned into fertilizer, which far outperforms previous models of fertilizers. Yeah, I mean, it's only outperforming cow sh but. You couldn't do it, so shut up. Humans can eat it, but it doesn't really look or taste appetizing to them yet, so they've widely avoided it thus far. These will be the ingredients you will need. Three cups of penne pasta, three cups worth of fresh crawl. Try to get a variety of sizes when you buy yours, or when you harvest them yourself. One cup of cheese, half a cup of green onion, one teaspoon of salt, two tablespoons of Cajun spice, two tablespoons of parsley, one tablespoon of dill, one tablespoon of garlic, a pinch of pepper, and finally, the most crucial ingredient. 
new dryer company's newly released flavor enhancer. Grab your crawl and a sharp knife. Begin to cut the meat into a rough mince. Doesn't that look appetizing? Don't you want to put this weird intestine monster directly into your mouth? No? You're just gonna sit there and insult our gracious dinner host like the horrible little goblin you are? Shut up and snort some flavor enhancer like the rest of us, you puss- Crawl is soft on the outside, but the interior has a surprising sturdiness. Then, gather the meat and set aside. Take your minced crawl and spread it evenly across the skillet. Stir occasionally until crisp and brown. Your crawl will be brown and crisp. I'm not trying to roast anyone's cooking, but I'm a bit of a chef myself, eating almost every creature I come across. And honestly, looking at this crawl, I think some nice cream sauce, maybe a penne a la vodka with some deep fried crawl dusting over the top would be nice. Or maybe just not eating the abomination in the first place. The crawl also provides the backbone to the other Vita Carnes life forms. Sometimes, a nice juicy little meat tumor will form on a section of the crawl. God, I'm getting hungry just thinking about it. This little giblet will fall off and become its own independent organism, one of which is known as a trimming. Trimmings are small animals that resemble skinned raccoons, which are things that aren't piled up in my garage. They're described as having a plump body, round head, small eyes, nose, and ear holes, and an agape mouth. Ready for, you know, yeah. Each of the individual trimmings are different with a unique body shape, number of limbs, and other characteristics. The largest recorded instance of a trimming is 20 centimeters in length. It feels good not to be the only thing described as an unsightly and cowardly creature, as as the trimming chooses to run and hide from danger in all circumstances rather than fight, it will first separate from the crawl and wander to find anything it can consume. Its diet consists of rotting plants and meat. Trimmers are omnivores and can hunt for meat and look for plants, but they're almost entirely scavengers. They lie at the bottom of the food chain, and in a normal species their numbers would decline, but the crawl's constant production of new trimmings keeps their population healthy. These creatures reach maturity in around seven months and have a lifespan of two to four years. They're often considered pests as they dig through human trash cans like me, but some people keep these meatballs as pets. You may want to get yourself a trimming. These lumps of meat have grown a reputation to be a loving companion for many people in the recent months. Although, most people may not know the proper ways to care for them. Taking care of a trimming is fairly easy. The first thing to keep in mind when keeping a trimming is the temperature of your home. While trimmings are resilient to both high and low conditions, you want to keep your base temperature near room temp, maybe slightly cooler. That being said, trimmings prefer warmer areas to nest. A simple setup you may use is a box with some blankets on the inside. And now, you have a comfy bed for your buddy. Trimmings are not picky eaters and will eat anything you give them. A diet of dry cat or dog food that is high in protein, provided two times a day, is best. Trimmings are nocturnal and make plenty of noise. To prevent you from having sleepless nights, some toys that trimmings like are little items they can push, around, pull, or carry. Trimmings also enjoy things that you enjoy as well, like watching the television or listening to the radio. They love seeing and listening to all the funny things coming from the devices. Remember to be careful around their face and avoid getting soap in their eyes, nose, and mouth. Gently pat dry with a towel when done. Now your buddy is all clean. And lastly, as said before, trimmings are social creatures, so be sure to give them plenty of affection. Since they communicate with each other in the wild, 
it is best to replicate this behavior with them as well. Simply talking to them is plenty enough. The next Viracarnis species on the docket is the meat snake. Meat snakes can only be found in moderate temperature climates. It's described as a worm-like creature made from a variety of types of meat. It grows throughout its lifespan, and the size of the meat snake in question depends on how much it consumes. When it first separates from the crawl, like your meat snake, it's only a few centimeters long. Eventually, it will reach an average length of 5 meters. Under extreme conditions such as natural disasters, wars, plagues, it can greatly surpass this length. Meat snakes are scavengers, consisting entirely of dead animals and viscera. They're incapable of consuming healthy living organisms, and thus, when the presence of dead matter skyrockets, so does meat snake population and size of the individuals. Remember kids, where there is death, there is meat snakes. The meat snake locates its food using a tongue-like organ similar to the Jacobson's organs found on regular snakes, licking and smelling the ground to see if anything decided to die near it. Once it locates the corpse, the meat snake will swallow the entire body whole. It breaks down some of the meat and bones, yes it can digest bone, immediately, but uses a separate set of digestive chemicals to preserve and ferment some of them. Cutting open a meat snake to retrieve this fermented meat was a hobby of mine when I was in interdimensional college, cause fermented stuff makes alcohol, and meat snake meat gets you real fucked up if it's fresh. It incorporates this new animal matter directly into its own body, lengthening the meat snake. Unsatisfactory parts for construction such as skulls, bones, teeth, and fingernails will be pooed out. Fun fact about the meat snake is they all have different skulls. This is because the meat snake will use the skull of an earlier dead body as its own face. Neat! It was never given its own face as a child, but instead of complaining and doing nothing, it made the best of its situation and now has a unique face of its own. You know, you and I could really learn a thing or two from meat snake. A meat snake's lifespan depends on how much it consumes. The longest on record was 28 years. The meat snake has no predators and is immune to disease due to its internal chemistry. The only way they can die is starvation, burning, or complete destruction of its outer coating. Last time I heard the words meat snake this much, I was paying for the procedure after the condom broke. You try making two of these videos a week, you dick. The meat snake is also the only member of the Carnus family capable of reproduction. When it reaches an excessive size, it splits into two meat snakes via mitosis. These creatures are quite docile, and because of this, humanity tends to use these creatures as a safe disposal of biological matter. These wiggly boys are quite helpful for those needing to get rid of dead bodies, which, let's be honest, isn't that all of us? In one instance, a meat snake was found to have blocked an entire subterranean tunnel. Its coloration was a deep purple, contrary to the blood red that they usually are. It also barely moved, even in contrast to the sluggish nature of a meat snake in general. It's described as seemingly lacking any motor function, like a plant. It was stationary with only minor movements within its body, easily mistaken for a corpse. Of course, with this discovery, many pressing questions come to light, like, would you stick your dick in it? How the hell did it get in there? And why is it so big? The skin was so tough that it took several days of cutting to even get a sample. Testing of the sample revealed that little, if anything, could be done to damage the skin of this worm. Normally meat snakes smell like dead bodies, but for some reason this one had a pleasant scent of cooking scrambled eggs. On the other side of this gargantuan phallic body, a cleaning crew discovered that it grew this big because of a word that got cut off, but I assume it was meant to be a massive pile of corpses. Where there is death, there are meat snakes. The next Carnage species are meat mimics. Meat mimics are bipedal creatures with uncanny similarities to human beings. They resemble humans without skin, save for some exaggerated features. Extended fingers, long spindly limbs, bulging eyes and a cavernous tooth-filled maw. The mimic has more teeth than the average human, and their mouth is basically filled with entirely incisors. Although it resembles a happy face, this is just a coincidence, which is some pretty heavy foreshadowing right there. A mature mimic's diet is composed entirely of human flesh. There it is. I was waiting for that part, and thus is only located around human populations. Like many members of the Vita Carnes family, the mimic has a complicated life cycle. First, it separates from the crawl, looking much like a trimming, but thin and sleek, only having four appendages. In this stage, it will hunt small animals, moving on to larger and larger creatures as it grows. They grow up so fast. When it's large enough, it will metamorphose into its next stage the human stage. In this stage, it begins stalking and feeding on humans, and thus, its hunting strategy becomes much more advanced, signifying increased intelligence. Like how humans target other humans, it locates a human-populated area and searches for the easiest target, which is usually the dumbest, fattest, oldest, sickest human around, also the ugliest. It uses things to blend in, like clothing, objects, and furniture. Once the target is found, it will observe the victim in its routine 
noting times in which it is more vulnerable, typically when the human sleeps. Once the prey is in position, the mimic will advance silently, proceeding to murder and devour the human. Once satiated, it will return to the wilderness to digest its meal. If the prey is awake, the mimic can use a series of sounds to confuse or trick the prey into a vulnerable situation. See, that right there is why I own a gun. See, finishing that sentence right there is a move of a demonetized man. The next stage of a mimic's life cycle has two possibilities. If it has a stable amount of food, it will grow more human-like features, skin, hair, etc., and will eventually look almost identical to a human, save for its uncanny features. Fake it till you make it. That's what I always say. This allows it to blend into civilization and to lure humans more effectively to their death and digestion. When it has an overabundance of food, it will grow into a larger being, Portions increasing in length, and its human-like features will fade away. It grows a dark, thick, flexible skin membrane, which is highly durable and increases in strength as the mimic consumes more. It's completely covered in this other than the face, which now has pinkish skin. You look like a clown! The teeth have moved back further into its maw as well, leaving the elder mimic's mouth as a toothless grin. Hey, baby, I'll call you when it's time for smash or pass. Its darker skin provides excellent night camouflage, and it refines its hunting skills to an unprecedented rate. Human governments don't like their citizens getting myrtled and eaten, so they created safety guidelines for mimics. 1. Avoid going out alone if your location is known to have mimics. 2. If you encounter a stationary mimic, leave the location and alert authorities. 3. If pursued by a mimic, get yourself into a position where you can run. Mimics are unlikely to attack humans with a clear escape route. 4. If you have been cornered, roll into the fetal position and protect your neck, face, and vital organs. Make as much noise as you can. My strategy would be shoot first and ask questions later, just like when I worked at Toys R Us. If you have a weapon, don't use it. I get that this thing is pretty tough, but how in the hell is fetal position a better strategy than fucking shoot it? This is like those fire drills where all the teachers just wanted us to shut up, so they said we had to be quiet, too. Oh, guys, come on. The fire might hear you. You just want me to die, you jerk. In a situation where a mimic is hunting in the immediate area and is not aware of your position, hide somewhere low, as mimics have ADHD and won't linger long to search for prey. The harvester is a specialized form of crawl, one that functions in a unique and deadly way. Its crawl mother first grows its iconic meat tumor. But instead of it detaching like the case of a mimic or a trimming, it continues to grow using energy from its crawl mother. That right there is an example of an anomaly that knows you don't always have to take the traditional route to be successful. You do you, Harvester. Prove them wrong. From here, it grows a bulbous center mass and its own tendril root system. Its center mass grows to 3 meters in height and 2 meters in diameter. The harvester has two different types of specialized tendrils, which it can extend up to 150 meters outward from its center node. The first type of tendril is bulky and flat, lying just beneath the surface of the ground. It has two sets of spines that face upwards. When a creature wanders over the tendril, sensory receptors on the tendril detect the creature, and the spines clamp onto the animal while the tendril thrashes violently. The spines then inject neurotoxic and anticoagulant venoms, which cause paralysis and accelerated blood loss respectively. There is no cure for a harvester sting, and fatality is 100%. Well, that's the case for large earth mammals, but me? I inject this sh for fun. The second type of tendrils sense the blood and begin to wrap around the animal and slowly absorb the red life liquid. They then pull the body underground and feed until there is nothing but scraps left. The remains decompose, leading to prevalent plant life, hence attracting more animals. Oh, so when the harvester leaves decomposing remains, it's good for plant life. But when I do it, it's you better hope we don't find the other half of her. Humans are warned that if they find themselves near a harvester, they should throw something heavy towards the bulb to activate the first type of tendril and walk away from the bulb. I say, if you see one, run up and hug it. That way you can't f***ing complain anymore! Next unique little critter on the docket is the Host of Influence, but its friends call it the Host. Its name is derived from a host who invites guests to an event, not to be confused for a host, a harborer of parasites or disease. That sounds like something someone specifies when they're nervous that someone else might be nervous, which I am. The host is only found in North America. It's a semi-humanoid looking organism with the structure of a head, torso, and arms, but sharing no other characteristics with humans. Its head stands on a bent neck, with a slit inside that's used for feeding, and if you're super adventurous, maybe other things if you know what I mean. 
Okay, I'm sorry, I'll leave. The host's back is lined with pores that have hollow hair-like structures protruding from them. These fire biohazardous spores out into the air. Obtaining info about the host is very risky due to these spores, but that's okay, cause I got plenty of humans to throw at it. When inhaled, the particles will infect the brain of the organism. After a few hours, the brain and thought process of the affected individual will change. The first wave of symptoms include restlessness, sluggish movements, numbness, and lack of coordination. After a few hours of this, the second wave of symptoms begin. Dizziness, migraines, impaired speech, and trembles. Six to seven hours later, the organism will proceed to cease all activity and wander towards the infector host. And graciously open their chest cavity so the host can om nom 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 on all their delicious organs and viscera giblets inside. If the infected doesn't get to the host in 36 hours, the effects will fade and they will return to normal. Again, Earth life is a lightweight. We used to huff these spores in high school, they're just like really strong shrooms to us, but with a meaty undertone. If hosts can't find enough prey, like the common predatory oak tree, they will unroot themselves and move to find more animals to eat. Next up is the monolith, a creature first documented in June of 1972, in the town of Ah oh, yeah, I hear is beautiful this time of year. There are only lucky number seven monoliths, all located in a circular position 1.5 kilometers in diameter. The ring of monoliths surrounds I'm not sure if they bleeped because of secret or just dirty because of they're in a circle and it might be monolith bukkake. The monolith is a titanic sized being measuring 120 meters in height. It has two tree trunk like legs firmly embedded underground with many root like meat strands that extend horizontally underground for great distances. The creature itself is made of thousands of meaty strands tightly woven together to form its body structure. The strands end at the neck, fusing into a solid mass in the shape of an upside down triangle with a hole in the middle. Instead of arms, it has dozens of long rope-like appendages that barely reach the ground. Okay, <laughs> that's not ominous at all. Moving on, they apparently just stand and do nothing, except for the time where they didn't do nothing. They did something, and that something was bleeped out partially, but the part I could hear was that they were extremely aggressive and swung their appendages at some censored team, completely wiping them out. Whoa, Monolith. For the first thing you ever did, starting out very strong. I will watch your career with great interest. Eventually, because of the whole committing murder thing, military vehicles came, and then it roared out and produced an EMP blast, knocking out all technology in the vicinity. Then, humans shot rockets at it, and although it was damaged, it regenerated at great speeds and resumed its stance unfazed. <laughs> It's just, I, they keep knocking him down, he keeps getting back up. I'm sorry, I identify with the model of the story, we're moving on. The area has since been quartered off, and is now not available to the public. But I get to go because I'm special VIP and not like you broke bitches. The next critter on this list is the Singularity, an orb comprised of dark color minerals with hints of luminous colors within its core. Despite the horrific possibilities of what could go wrong, I think this will make a beautiful decoration in my apartment. The orb is estimated to be one meter in diameter, it has several unique qualities that are not well understood. In the Singularity's free time, it can be found suspended in the air by an unseen force. There's also a variety of readings coming from the orb itself. Magnetic fields, energy signatures, odd smells, and other signals are released by the Singularity. The population of these creatures are unknown, as is almost all information about the Singularity, because it's been hidden or confiscated by officials. They were only able to receive one classified document about it held it censored, but it's not held it censored anymore because I blew that place up. Tip 1. Unidentified disease. Biohazard warning. Several cases of an unidentified infection have been reported in several parish residents. Do not drink the water. The tumor yielded a strange and frightening discovery. They were filled with aggressive worm-like organisms. The sick are no longer human. It appears the organisms are being birthed from the virus. Stay human, don't drink the water.
August 8, 1988, an unidentified viral disease begins infecting people in the Tangipahoa waterways. The first evidence of this outbreak is reported by one Dr. Julia Williams. She claims that a virus, hereby nicknamed the Tangi virus, has begun infecting people who swam in the Tikfa River. Several patients were admitted with symptoms consisting of rashy skin, itchy throat, irritated eyes, nausea, and diarrhea. Patient 1, infant, asymptomatic. Patient 2, deceased, complications due to meningitis. Patient 3, child, stable. Patient four, pregnant adult, stable but lost child. Soon after the discovery of this disease, Dr. Williams learns that tumors are growing inside these patients. Not only that, but they seem to be gestating worm-like creatures inside of them. That's pretty neat. The virus initially reproduces in a lytic cycle, but undergoes metamorphosis in time, becoming a swarm of parasitic worm-like creatures. The virus state is likely the immature form, making the worms the next stage in the disease's development. The worms, once hatched, make their way to the brain and nervous systems. That's not ominous at all. Apparently, the only way to detect a secondary infection is via autopsy. Upon reporting this to her supervisor, Dr. Williams was assured that samples would be sent to the CDC. For some reason, her supervisor didn't really consider the brain worms a serious threat, despite Julia's tumor-latent research. Julia nosily contacts the CDC herself, and the CDC says it hasn't received the samples. When she confronts her supervisor, he says another parish confirmed the substances to be Giardia. Virology 101. I know you're a human, but a human child would wouldn't confuse these two for each other. In the following tape, we find out that despite her repeated warnings, the parish government has been promoting and supplying the water to all the people. The human researcher thinks the CDC was not alerted because the waterways are big money and the parish didn't want a possibly deadly disease tainting that valuable income that can be used to do white stuff out of hooker butthole. From an outside species perspective, I doubt that's the case, but we already know y'all love green paper more than controlling your own brains. She fears this may be a potential pandemic, but that's not the the most concerning aspect of this. But first, a quick word from our sponsors, the Tangifoa Waterways. Wasn't that just breathtaking? Anyways, patient four brutally killed her husband with her bare hands and then kidnapped patient one after murdering both of the child's parents. Patient three also violently attacked his parents to the point of hospitalization and all were last spotted in the waterways near Kate's Crossing. Several people have been reported to have gone missing on the river and our human researcher is convinced that it's connected. In the next report, we find that the summer went exactly as expected, more sick that recovered quickly, so no one gives a shit. The parish is building a landfill near the river. Rumor is they're covering something up. So my idea is if we just fill the river with trash, everyone will blame that for why they're sick instead of the virus. Some say it's a spaceship. I have no idea why they're saying that. It seems kind of out of nowhere. She says she's going to threaten to go to the press and was terminated from her job immediately. When she returned to her office, she found a tape on her desk with a note that said, Lab 8, come at night. The following was recovered from a missing persons case. Tape 7 is called Alien. Apparently, her supervisor and his assistant were the ones who left the tape. They were trying to figure out who they can trust with the current threat. They believe most of the parish government has been infected. The virus is sentient. It doesn't want to just spread. It wants to control. The worms spread throughout the nervous system so they can override the host when needed. Hell, all right, game recognized game. This entity knows how to control a nervous system like a natural. The tumor acts as a second brain. Most will simply succumb to the virus and lose control. A small portion will die, and the remaining victims will mutate into giant amphibious-like creatures, as is the obvious next step. Afterwards, they went to her supervisor Jim's home and had an orgy. Jim explained that the local government was going to introduce the virus into the water supply. They discussed plans of how to go public over a nice bottle of wine. So romantic. Suddenly, she awoke and realized she had passed out. Don't worry, this story gets dark, but not that dark. She was alone, and Jim had left a note. Welcome to the family and see you back at work in two weeks. Last night, Jim seemed confident that they could get the CDC and military involved. She returns to work feeling under the weather. <coughs> Foreshadowing. But her and Jim have a big meeting today, so the show must go on. Jim wasn't at work today, but he left the bottle of wine they shared two weeks ago with instructions to analyze it. So she did, finding samples of the virus. She's infected with the Tangi virus. Called it. What a twist. She immediately left, and as she drove away, the staff of the entire building watched her 
teenager from the parking lot, smiling deviously. Jump to February 5th, 1990. She's working in a veterinarian's office, poisoning her body with antiparasitic drugs and chemotherapy meant for dogs. I've been there, homie. Fun fact, dog Xanax is just regular Xanax, but smaller. Do with that information what you will. She's 40 pounds underweight, bald, and her mouth is covered in sores, but she's kept the disease from overtaking her, buying her time until she can find a cure. By late April, she can feel the worms scratching at her skull, the drugs becoming less effective. Her fingers are spasming, her eyes are twitching. She is dying. May 5th, 1990. She's been having strange dreams, thinking about Ireland, France, moving to the States for med school. June 15th, 1990. I miss my mom and my dad. There's so much I wanted to do. I wanted to meet someone, grow old, have kids. Now I'll never do anything. August 27th, 1990. I can hear them now. They want me to consider them my children. I consider them a plague. September 21st, 1990. I lost my job at the vet's office. My memory isn't what it used to be. I'm mailing these tapes to the FPTV cable station. The council too. Maybe they can use what I learned to save us. October 5th, 1990. I'm ending things tonight. If anyone watching this wants to low my last words there, boil anything you drink. It kills the virus. After the old FPTV building was torn down, hundreds of VHS tapes needed to be digitized and cataloged. Most of it seemed mundane, but on 12.03.90, a mysterious message appeared in the channel's nightly ad sections. It appeared only once. Don't trust your government. They have sold you out. You have been why would anyone trust the government? What do you think, I'm an idiot? Three days later, an ill-timed boil advisory appeared during a pre-recorded newscast. Man, it's hysterical. <laughs> By working with the property owners and other concerned groups throughout the parish, we have made great strides in cleaning the river such as this. The Nittalbany River is a big concern of ours. By having the landfill nearby, it does create a possible uh, image of polluting that river, but I can assure you, we at the landfill are making every effort that we possibly can to see that the landfill does not pollute any river, any stream, any body of water uh, throughout this parish. And I am This is the dumbest sentient virus I've ever met. And I don't say that lightly. You infect an entire town's worth of people and you choose the most fifth grade science teacher ass looks like a priest that touches kids mother to be your wooden actor? You want people to pay attention. You get the two most attractive people in town and make them get naked. I guarantee people will watch your water commercial or whatever this is. I like to imagine this guy seeing his pre-recorded newscast with the boil water advisory in it and then just like slumping down into his chair. Boiling water saves lives. You just gotta make sure to drink it while it's still boiling though or else it's not safe. Within a week of the boil water advisory, the parish was gripped in an environmental disaster. They responded to this by bragging about their health center. And then they said you should go there if your health gets a bit fucky wucky. In the following few days, the boil water advisory was dropped with no warning or news coverage. Just a strange 15 second spot saying the boil advisory was lifted. And the parish government adopted a strange aggressive pro-drinking water campaign? And terror has come to America. And this typical day in anywhere USA, whether rural or urban, will be forever changed. In the aftermath of such devastation, we'll see a shift, a return in focus to the small town roots of morality. A morality that has remained rooted and intact beneath the camouflage of the everyday citizen's hustle. Life is a fragile gift that is delivered to us in pieces, in small moments, and it only achieves meaning as we cherish and blend the pieces, even the seemingly insignificant pieces, into a full universal whole. Okay, this ad immediately screams to me that the water is not safe. Despite the continuous pro-water ads, the Tangifoa Parish seemed to be getting back to normal. We then see a newscast with a pro-drinking water ad, followed by an anti-drinking water biohazard warning. Biohazard warning. Unknown substance detected in the water. Do not drink the water. Do not bathe in the water. 
Do not give to pets. Boiling is not enough. Water could be highly toxic. Something unnatural is in the water. The sick are no longer human. Stay human. Don't drink the water. Guys, this is you in politics all over again. I'm not gonna pick a side just because you hate each other. You need to recognize that you're both stupid. According to those living in the parish at the time, panic followed this message's broadcast. No idea why that would happen. It just pointed out the one resource keeping you alive is literal poison. Anti-water messages began to appear during random broadcasts. Within days of the warning, parish officials began working around the clock at the landfill. What they were doing was never disclosed to the public. Following this, the following message was played 24-7 for a week. until it was abruptly stopped by a different message. Nothing was ever said about the odd event ever again, except right now, which is when we're talking about it. Wait, how does this video know that no one ever talked about it again? How do you like, can you check that? Most consider it a joke. A few think it was something more sinister. We will probably never know, but I'm gonna tell you it's monsters definitely. Update, the Tangifoa government has asked the uploader to take down the videos, and he's not sure how much longer they'll stay up. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and say fuck the Tangifoa government, Pahoa, Tangi Pahoa, uh, and keep my videos up. Not really, I'm sure you're wonderful people, and if you have an issue, we can talk this out rather than just going through YouTube. In the late 90s, an unnamed storm settled over Southeast Louisiana. Flash floods occurred without warning. Most of the population was trapped when the the Tangifoa River overflowed. The area was devastated with the town of Cates Crossing being hit the hardest. The fire department was sent to evacuate citizens. Despite their best efforts, the bodies of over 200 people were never found. Most blame the rising rivers, but some say it was something else. The men and women serving that day still don't speak of the Great Flood. This tape is the only first-hand account of that event, and I'm just gonna play it in its entirety. Gary, come in. What's your ETA? Five minutes, give or take. Copy that. Call her back when you get on scene. Roger that. Over and out. Molly, come in. Go ahead. I'm at the old church and there's nobody here. You at the old Baptist? Looking right at it. And it's him. Somebody must have beat you to it. Look, we got an elderly couple southbound. Can you do it? Then four. I'm on it. Hey Molly, the elderly couple is in my A. Can you call HQ and see if someone's making these rescues? 10-4, I'll put the word out. Hey Molly, I'm at the Collins Wood subdivision. Where are they? All the way in the back. 10-4. Molly, I'm at the back of the Collins Wood. No one's here. There's no way someone else evacuated 30 people. Have you heard anything from HQ? That's a negative. Try again. What the hell was that? Sorry, trying to get some caffeine. N no, I, I heard something. Wouldn't worry about it. Probably just an animal. The other guy said they've been hearing all sorts of stuff. Look. 
I'm gonna start making my way back to you, okay? 10-4. Gary, come in. How close are you to North Street? Hmm, about a block away. We have a Jane Doe in need of medical. She has lacerations on her right arm. Says she was attacked by a monster in the middle of evacuation. Oh, what? I don't know. Probably was a snake or gator. Hold on. <laughs> Gary, I'm gonna have to let you go. Some kind of emergency in the front office. Nothing like a flood to bring out the best in people. Again, there's no one here, but something doesn't seem right. Molly, you there? Molly, come in, please. Jesus Christ, that sounds close. Lieutenant Gary Davis was never found. During the cleanup, rumors of monsters in the water circulated throughout the community. However, the parish quickly squashed those rumors. People to this day go missing in the Tangipahoa River. We invite you to come visit the best kept secret in Louisiana, Tangipahoa Parish. Business is booming, restaurants have reopened, miles of waterways are ready for you to enjoy. Every weekend, there's something fun to do in our little parish. Since the Great Flood, we have rebuilt our community into the perfect place to raise your family. So come and visit your friends in Tangipahoa Parish. You might even find you'll never want to leave. But if you do, we'll be happy to send a piece of our community home with you. We here in Tangipahoa Parish are proud to announce Tangi Water will be available in every major supermarket in America. And who knows, maybe soon, people all over the world might get a chance to enjoy a cool, refreshing taste of tangy water. Tangy water, it'll change you. Oh, uh, shit. Looks like we gotta save this species dumbass again, huh? But I do know we're near New Orleans, so let's go drink in the street? Most gruesome case yet. Same style of trophy as the other three victims. Made out of her skin, too. I warn you, sir. This won't be easy to see. Investigators have recently found several artifacts relating to what appears to be an active crime scene. These artifacts resemble regular Furbies, except with all non-mechanical components swapped out for human body parts. These flesh Furbies, or flesh bees slash skin bees, as they have now been dubbed, have been popping up all over London. These flesh bees emanate a stench of decay, both because they're actively rotting, and also because there's usually a decomposing body with a bunch of pieces nearby. Looks like Jack the Ripper and Ed Gein had a baby with a Gen Z sense of humor. In cases where the victim is not easily located nearby, DNA testing of these flesh bees have revealed that these pieces were taken from individuals that have been declared missing shortly beforehand. Look on the bright side. 
We know they're not missing anymore. The first skin beef found was assembled using human skin, hair, and teeth, and had weird little Furby feet made out of fingers. Other variations of these horrific children's toy recreations have been documented containing human eyes, ears, toes, as well as some seemingly random internal organs as well. In some instances, flesh bees were found constructed entirely of scrotums, labia, and genitalia. For some reason, these ones sold out the quickest on my murder memorabilia site that I'm totally not stealing Furbies to sell them on. These flesh bees still contain the mechanical parts that standard issue Furbies come out of the factory with, and thus are entirely functional. They have some standard Furby behavior, as well as some unexplainable quirks. For instance, these skin bees have new sayings that I highly doubt a board of executives approved, such as, The pain! It is unending! Please don't kill me, I have a family! Why the f am I a Furby? The flesh bees can seemingly quote memories from their past life. The most common recalled memory among these flesh bees is their brutal end. Dude, it was like this morning. Get over it! Some theorize that both the consciousness and soul of the victim has been trapped inside these children's toys. And by some, I mean me. The skin bees have also displayed disturbing behavior. Among other things, flesh bees have been noted following people around, hiding and staring at people for extended periods of time until discovered, and even displaying violent tendencies. Most often, they will latch down on the appendage of a victim and increase the tension until said digit is severed. This was the end of the infamous self-appointed Furby fucker. With any situation like this, there's a lot of unanswered questions. First of all, what the actual fuck? Is this perhaps a serial killer trying to get out some sort of Hasbro-themed message? Or maybe it's some dirty witch lady trying to attempt an occult Furby ritual. These theories were stupid enough on their own, but something was about to happen to disprove them entirely. In the coming weeks, these flesh bees randomly appeared on store shelves, replacing all their non-human organ-made counterparts. The same day that this happened in the brick-and-mortar establishments, suddenly, all regular Furbies from online retailers were replaced by the haphazardly created monstrosities. Not not only that, but all previously purchased Furbies were replaced with their horrific counterparts as well, suggesting that we're dealing with more than just a serial killer. I mean, like, probably. I, I know the amount of effort it takes to turn multiple human corpses into Furbies is likely immense, but I don't think that makes them capable of something this grand of scale. No, we're dealing with an anomalous threat to humanity. And that means someone is f***ing with my turf again! There's only one being powerful enough to do something like this. We can't just let this happen, Amoeba. We have to do what we should have done in the first place. Take on the biggest threat to mankind. Planets. Observer 4 probe findings explained. That's right, we've been blessed with evidence detailing extraterrestrial life, and I'm going to be putting this info into context so your human brain can more easily understand it. So let's get into it! Planets is an analog horror detailing the 48-year expedition of the Observer 4 space probe, as well as the evidence of extraterrestrial life and strange astrological phenomena found during the journey. The Observer 4 was launched in 2038 and recovered in 2086, and the data inside the probe was shocking to say the least. I know what you're thinking, how is it analog horror if it takes place in the future? And the answer is shut the f*** up! We know about these planets because of one YouTube channel run by a fish by the name of Black Dragonfish. I'll be linking to their findings below. At first, all seems routine for the Observer 4 as it approaches a neighboring solar system, snapping some candid pics of some asteroids as it passes. It examines some normal enough seeming planets and their moons, but after a moment the mood seems to slowly but surely darken, foreshadowing that something might not be quite right with the Observer 4. One of the first indications that the Observer 4 probe is acting strangely is when it approaches the planet Horus. Horus is noted as an inhospitable ice planet that has a quote-unquote face that is used for experiments. My question is, how would humans be able to determine that Horus is used for experiments if they literally just discovered it this moment using this probe? Did you guess? Unless I'm missing something, it seems like someone or something else is adding information that it would be impossible for humanity to know based on its current circumstances. The next planet that Observer 4 comes across is Helios. Helios is unique as its moons are alive. I'm not sure if this means the moons themselves are alive or they just contain biological ecosystems. The language feels intentionally vague. There's something missing here. So if this guy is anything like me, he doesn't know either. Tartarus, named for the Greek mythology's version of hell, is the most unique of the moons as it is the most organic in nature, with more biodiversity than the food in the back of the fridge that no one's quite sure what it uses to be. The probe describes it as a wandering, quietly weeping gateway. Can't shake the feeling that it's in some way related to its name. Keeping up with the hell naming scheme, the next planet the observer approaches is Baphomet.
planet, named for goat f***er over here. The planet is as black as coal and a terrifying nightmare, as opposed to a not terrifying nightmare. The next planet, Anukit, named for the Nile goddess, is described as a water world. Just like Earth, its oceans are home to yet undiscovered, unimaginable horrors. It has many moons, but none have been photographed. I'm not sure if they just couldn't find it, or the observer just got lazy, but all I know is what's in this space probe that I stole, so we're moving on. The most significant and concerning media that the probe contains is about the world of Hathor. Hathor, home, a second Earth, life. Isn't it beautiful? Interloper, we're watching. Satan, moon of Hathor. You found new life. Isn't this what you wanted? May 31st, 2075. Observer 4 loses connection. October 24th, 2075. Connection is regained. February 4th, 2086. Observer approaches Earth. Recovered by yours truly. If you don't know much about space travel, I can't blame you because your species mostly uses its technology to spike dopamine. Mandatory species sensitivity training says you can't blame people for what they're born into, but any idiot can see this is not regular space probe protocol. This craft lost connection with Earth, then regained connection already en route back to the human homeworld. The thing is, humans wouldn't be able to reprogram it to come back if they lost connections with the probe. We know that the probe doesn't return to Earth as a failsafe for lost connections because it didn't do so when it lost connection previously. That means that something else must have intercepted it, reprogrammed it, and tampered with its data, leaving messages. Seemingly threatening warning messages. With the flashing word of home on Hathor and the fact that this was the last world it visited before it lost connection and was rerouted back to Earth, it seems like whatever messed with your little probe here was native to Hathor. They also seem to know a bit about you guys, as they're really layering in the satanic imagery and names because they know it freaks y'all out. Those threats sound like they are coming from someone who feels that they are backed in a corner. Now to a human brain, that might sound like you have the upper hand. And you might, but nothing bites harder, faster, and with less abandon than a snarling dog backed into a corner. My advice, find another exoplanet. They obviously do not want to be friends with benefits, and after the millionth open an R, you just gotta take the L. Corner folk. What? are corner folk. If you saw small milky humanoids interdimensionally traveling in the corners of your home, would you grab the camera to calmly make a narrated educational video about them? Why are so many interdimensional gateways at some guy named Riley's house? What is the corner world? And why do the corner folk put short people in jail? Stay tuned to find out right now. The corner folk were first reported by a man named Riley Tillen. We know about Riley's documentation because of one Alex Kansas, the same human who documented the monument mythos. I will be linking to their work in the description. Alex's first video about the corner folk is a compilation of four videos uploaded by Riley, three of which in 2011 and one of which in 2013. The first of the four videos opens with Riley matter-of-factly explaining how there are multiple different dimensions and they all intersect with our own. These intersections are called corners. Most entities from one dimension are locked within their own dimension, and cannot perceive entities living in other dimensions even when at a corner. Can't imagine how it feels to be that limited in experience. Anyways, beings worth a damn like the corner folk are able to pass through the corners and travel between dimensions. I think the name corner folk is a bit derivative. That would be like if I called you cell phone ape. Because of this ability, corner folk are considered a trans-dimensional species. Can I say, so happy to see trans-dimensional species representation in the media. Apparently, the corners of Riley's home just happened to line up with some key corners for dimensional transit. Because of this, the creamy corner folk like to curl up in the corners of Riley's house while he's not around and exhibit micro movements similar to that of dreaming animals. We can see in the following clip what it looks like when corner folk travel through Riley's house because I stole his iPhone and got this footage in addition to his nudes. So we know that they're jumping dimensions, but why are they doing it? Riley thinks that the corner folk might only leave their dimension for food, like humans only leave the house for resources. If you only leave your house for the bare minimum resources to survive, I'm ashamed to say that I can relate. The little corner folk have patterns on their skin, imprinted there from being haphazardly crammed into nurseries slash prisons in the corner world made out of corners to secure slash trap the infants. If you're quick to judge the corner folk for putting their youth in jail, just remember high school, and then remember how annoying you were in high school. They were right to put you in there. 
Riley thinks that the corners in his house are being used as in-between points for dimensional travel, like a rest stop. I mean, he's kinda right, but only in the fact that everyone pees there. After a while of this crap, Riley began to fixate on a dimension known as the Corner World. The Corner World is a world made up of a bunch of trans-dimensional intersections that's far too complex for your human brain to understand, so we just said fuck it, here's a bunch of lines. Anyways, Riley starts dreaming about the Corner World, and like any rational being, he stays inside for weeks to obsessively draw what haunts his slumber. He begins to claim that the corner folk are taunting him, and no sh** dude, they can travel dimensions and you don't even leave your house. He then says that he wants to enter the corner world, and he is not afraid of what happens to him when he does. Riley then jumps into a corner of his house and we get a look into the corner world. Imagine being so dumb, you try to film a dimension made of dimensions with a third dimensional camera. After a mental health and wellness check was called in cause someone saw that video, authorities discovered Riley asleep in a corner, his internal organs folded across various axes. He somehow survived his intestines being turned into origami, and he made origami his whole recovery despite never having been taught it. So what does this mean? Well for one, Riley's a nut job who talks like he put acid tabs in his cereal regardless of whether or not the corner folk are real. It also means we have to figure out what the corner folk want and what the hell they are in the first place. Corner folk. Corner baby? Corner girl? Corner pedophile? Are these trans-dimensional creatures murdering infants and then cramming them into the front windows of admittedly fuel-efficient vehicles? How can a human being possibly enter the corner world and come out unfolded? Who is the corner girl, and can she be saved? And what do corner folk taste like? Find out this time on In The Corner. If you haven't seen my first video on the corner folk, you should definitely go watch it. It explains one man's experience documenting them as well as other trans-dimensional phenomena taking place in the corners of his home. If you don't watch it, you'll probably be really confused and I will trap you inside of the corner world. The corner folk were first reported by a man named Riley Tillen, who documented them using his home as a sort of rest stop for interdimensional travel and then tried to enter the corner world, which is a dimension made of other dimensions intersecting. And then all of his organs turned into anatomy origami and he was never the same. Same. Got it? Good. We know about Riley's documentation because of one Alex Kansas, the same human who documented the monument mythos. I will be linking to their work in the description. Now without further ado, let's get into the most anticipated animated event since Pokemon 3 Michael Vick returns, Corner Folk 2. The next video in the Corner Folk series is Corner Baby. Unlike the first Corner Folk video, it doesn't star our boy Riley Tillin, it stars the man, the myth, the legend, Alex Kansas himself. It details a crew building a set in an abandoned nursery. Despite taking place on September 21st, 2021, the video starts with music that reminds me of a 2014 life hack video. The nursery is pretty decrepit, as most of its windows have been shattered. Anyways, during the four hours of mind-numbing painting that it took to create the set, somebody pulled up in a car and parked it near Alex and his squad. Now, I have already found something suspicious about this video. It claims to be taking place in 2021, but right here they are seen bottle flipping. This must mean one of two things. A, the video date is incorrect, or B, that's pretty cringe. Anyways, shortly after Alex's stint of being way too focused on someone doing a bottle flip, he's told to come outside by his friend who has purportedly found something disturbing. What? What is it? Why? What? Why is there someone outside? No, um... I might be saying things, but I'm not sure exactly what's going on in this car. What? Where am I looking at? Next to the rear view window. Rear view, rear view, rear view mirror. Okay, if that thing is a baby, it's either incredibly deflated, or someone has dropped it headfirst on the ground from at least the height of a truck bed. So, Alex called the police immediately, who said it wasn't the first time they broke windows to recover children. Why didn't they specify car windows? Are they just like breaking into kids' rooms through their windows to quote unquote recover them at night? Side note, the upbeat music stops here, but I think the part about the possibly dead kid would be much funnier if they kept the track rolling. Then we're shown pictures of a demo site where we are told 
the nursery doesn't exist anymore. No mention as to whether or not the kid still exists. Actually, this one cop got really defensive when we found it strange that a dead baby needs to go in the evidence locker, but we're here to talk about the corner folk. So, what does this have to do with the corner folk? I don't fucking know. Well, since the corner folk's travel locations are usually in corners in the real world, and that baby was crammed really hard into the corner of a car window and seemingly left there folded like a pretzel, I'd be willing to bet a decent amount of corner cash that we already know our culprit in the baby car corner catastrophe. The next video in this series is Corner Girl, and if you think calling this series an analog horror was a stretch because it wasn't that scary, I'm happy to say you can put those non-fears to rest. Corner Girl opens with grainy footage of what is either an unconscious female or a corpse, and what sounds like audio from an educational video teaching children about the amount of corners in different shapes. Text flashes on the bottom claiming that the person behind the camera is not Alex Kansas, and that he just moves luggage, and that Alex based Riley Tillen on him. She was luggage. You are luggage too. Luggage is so easy to lose. <laughs> Sincerely, Alex's inspiration. So what does this mean? There's obviously a lot of questions unanswered, but I think enough information is there to flesh out the world slightly more. First of all, we know that regular humans are indeed able to enter the corner world without being folded into oblivion. We also know that the corner world is being used for some form of human trafficking. Whether or not Alex's inspiration is using the corner world as a rest stop to move people from point A to point B in our world, or is just storing them in the corner world for some probably horrific purpose is yet unknown. This info also brings into the question, what the corner people are. It could be possible that after prolonged exposure to the corner world, one would become so folded that they would somehow resemble a corner folk, which doesn't make any sense, but shut up. This is just a theory, but it's possible that whoever Riley is based on is leaving people in corner prisons until they become corner folk themselves. Why? I don't know. I'm like half sure that I'm completely wrong anyways because there's not enough info to- so if I know if I'm accurate. Humans will believe anything you tell them. Their brain is as smooth as a Ken doll's crotch. If you like this video for some reason, you should like, comment, and subscribe with all notifications enabled, or I'll turn you into a fucking skin Furby. Seriously, YouTube is not being kind to me as of late, so if you always ignore this message at the end, maybe don't this time. Shout out the inner circle. Love y'all. <laughs>